Writing is a skill that takes careful study and practice, and knowing how to avoid plagiarism, whether the plagiarism is intentional or not, is a key aspect of good communication. Not only that, but committing an act of plagiarism can have dire professional consequences, so it is worth investing the time and energy to learn how to prevent it from happening. In this lesson, we will explore what plagiarism is as applied to written communications. We will discuss when to cite and when to quote, and how to cite and quote in the APA style. We will also say a few words about writing style as it applies to when it would be appropriate to quote and when it would be appropriate to paraphrase. Spoiler alert, you should paraphrase in most cases. We will discuss how to properly paraphrase from a source and talk about instances where students might think they're paraphrasing, but they're actually plagiarizing, even if they didn't mean to. Finally, over paraphrasing and over citing can and do happen, and you will learn about how far to go with each. First, you probably already have some idea of what plagiarism is. Let's see what you think. Is this plagiarism? Copying a sentence from another source and pasting it word for word into your own paper without giving credit to the original source. Copying a sentence from another source and pasting it word for word into your own paper and giving credit to the original source, but without quotation marks. Taking an idea from another source and writing it in your own words without giving credit to the original source and copying a sentence from another source and pasting it word for word into your own paper, then changing a few words and giving credit to the original source. In fact, these are all examples of plagiarism. Now, there are forms of plagiarism in domains like art, video, and music, but in this video, we will only focus on plagiarism specific to written communications. And in this context, plagiarism means taking information that you got from another source, like a book, a journal article, newspaper, blog, website, anything that you didn't come up with, and using it as a way that makes it look like it's your own work. This includes not only words, but also information or ideas. Sometimes students are not aware of this, but remember that basically anything that did not come from your own original thought must be cited in some way. One of the most common confusions I see among students is that they're not aware that they need to indicate whether they took just the ideas or also exact wording from the original source. So this guide is going to be very helpful. Let's say as you're reading a book, you come across an example of a study that you want to mention in your paper. This is an example of getting a piece of information or an idea from another source since you didn't actually dream it up yourself. In this case, you must indicate in your paper where you got the information from by citing it, even if you use your own words. If instead of writing in your own words, you decide to copy and paste exactly what you're reading in your book, you must not only cite where you got the material from, but also use proper quotation techniques to indicate that those words also came from the book. In other words, a citation tells the reader that the information or idea came from somewhere else, and a quotation tells the reader that the words also came from somewhere else. The original source, by the way, doesn't necessarily have to be written sources. Even personal verbal communications need to be cited and or quoted where appropriate. Let's go through a few examples. Here's an example of the original source, which contains exact words as they appear in a book by Schachter, Gilbert, Wagner, and Nock, 2014, on page 255. Suggestibility is the tendency to incorporate misleading information from external sources into personal recollections. Suppose in your paper you've decided to include the following. Suggestibility is the tendency to incorporate misleading information from external sources into personal recollections. Is this plagiarism? And if it is plagiarism, what is it missing? The answer is a resounding yes. This is severely plagiarized as it is missing both quotation marks and a citation. By writing this sentence in your paper without quotation or citation, you are telling the reader that these words and these thoughts are your own, neither of which is true. 
So how about this? You write, suggestibility is the tendency to incorporate misleading information from external sources into personal recollections. Schachter, Gilbert, Wagner, and Nock, 2014. Is this plagiarism? This version is still plagiarized because it is missing quotation marks. So you're acknowledging to the reader that you got the information from the source, but not the words. Okay, so how about this? Quote, suggestibility is the tendency to incorporate misleading information from external sources into personal recollections. End quote. Schachter, Gilbert, Wagner, and Nock, 2014, page 255. Is this plagiarism? This is not plagiarism because it is properly cited and quoted. Citations, by the way, don't necessarily have to be inside parentheses and placed after the end of a sentence. Here's another version that would work just as well. According to Schachter, Gilbert, Wegner, and Nock, 2014, quote, suggestibility is the tendency to incorporate misleading information from external sources into personal recollections, end quote, page 255. Also, note that here I'm giving you an example of a fairly short quote. If the original material you're quoting is fewer than 40 words, then you would put quotation marks around the words like we did here. If it is longer than 40 words, then a block quote without the quotation marks is needed. Consult the APA publication manual for details. Speaking of the APA publication manual, it dictates that anytime you quote from a source, you must include the page number in the citation. Also, all citations that appear in the text of your paper must be included in the reference section at the end of your paper, which looks like this. Do not include in the reference section anything that was not cited within the text of the paper. So in other words, your in-text citations and your reference list should match up. If you want to learn more about how to cite and reference properly in APA style, you may want to check out these two wonderful online and free resources. The Basics of APA Style free tutorial by the American Psychological Association and the Purdue University Online Writing Lab's webpage on APA style. One more point on quoting, which is that direct quotations must be accurate. This means that anything that appears within quotation marks is assumed to be exactly the same from the original source. Same wording, same spelling, same text emphasis used like italics, etc. even if there's a mistake in the original source. If you change any part of the quote, like changing words or cutting out words to shorten the passage, you must indicate that somehow. Again, you should consult the APA publication manual for guidance. Although directly quoting from a source and then citing and quoting it properly isn't considered plagiarism, it is lazy writing. Writing is about expressing yourself. It is your paper, so you should take ownership of it and use your own voice. Otherwise, it isn't your paper. I mean, can you imagine reading a published book that contains little original thought, but instead presents a mishmash of quotes taken from different sources? Would you pay for a book like this? And would you call the author of the book a writer? In addition, we all have a certain style of expressing ourselves that comes through in writing. When you take a direct quote from another writer and insert it into your paper, it disrupts the flow of your expression. It is as if you're having a conversation with someone and every other sentence he's speaking in a different dialect. Can you imagine trying to make sense of what this person's saying? Remember I said earlier that good writing takes practice. The more you do it, the better you will be at it, and writing assignments give you that valuable opportunity to hone your writing skills. Trust me, no one learns to write by copying and pasting. This is not to say that there aren't times when direct quoting might actually be effective or even the better choice. When the original source is written so elegantly or in such a unique manner that it really wouldn't do it justice to express it any other way, it would be appropriate to quote it directly. An example of this would be classic lines like Shakespeare's quote, to be or not to be, that is the question, end quote. In a case like this, the meaning would be lost if you didn't directly quote the passage. 
Another case in which direct quoting would be appropriate is when you're using the quote to make a point. For instance, if you want to give an example of a comedian's humor, you might quote a joke that this person has made. In this case, the quote serves as supporting evidence to bolster your argument. There are other examples too, but in general, you should use quotations very sparingly. And be aware that for most of your writing assignments at school, there is very little chance that a quotation would be a better choice than using your own words. Which takes me to paraphrasing. Paraphrasing means using your own words to express ideas obtained from other sources. Now, remember I said earlier that anything that comes from another source needs to be cited. So even though you're rephrasing the information or idea in your own words, you still took it from the original source, and therefore you must cite it to let the reader know where the idea came from. One common strategy for paraphrasing is to copy a sentence from the original source, change a few words, and call it your own. Have you done this before? Well, guess what? I have news for you. This is still plagiarism, and it is one of the more common forms of unintentional plagiarism I've seen. When we say that to paraphrase is to express an idea in your own words, we don't mean literally just the words, but also the style. Let's take a look at an example. Here again, we have our original source. Suggestibility is the tendency to incorporate misleading information from external sources into personal recollections. Suppose this is what you write in your paper. Suggestibility refers to the tendency to integrate misleading material from outside sources into personal memories, Schachter, Gilbert, Wagner, and Nock, 2014. Is this plagiarism? Indeed, this is still plagiarized. The words underlined here are suspect, and your sentence is structured the same way as the original source. This is clearly a case where you took the original sentence and just changed a few words. Now, how about this? Suggestibility refers to, quote, the tendency to open square bracket, integrate, end square bracket, misleading, open square bracket, material, end square bracket, from open square bracket, outside, end square bracket, sources, into personal, open square bracket, memories, end square bracket, end quote. Schachter, Gilbert, Wagner, and Nock, 2014, page 255. Is this plagiarism? Well, since you did properly cite and quote this, it is not plagiarism, but it is incredibly awkward to read and will most likely earn you a stinky cheese face instead of an A on your paper. All right then, how about this? Suggestibility occurs when our own memories are distorted by inaccurate information from outside sources. Is this plagiarism? Yes, it is, because even though you're now using your own words, you need to credit the source where the idea came from, so you still need a citation. So let's try this. Suggestibility occurs when our own memories are distorted by inaccurate information from outside sources. Schachter, Gilbert, Wagner, and Nock, 2014. Is this plagiarism? Nope. This sentence is fully paraphrased and properly cited, and this is precisely what you should strive for as a budding writer. Now, although I've been emphasizing the practice of paraphrasing and citing, it's also important to know how not to go too far. For example, generally accepted and recognized names and terminology like self-awareness, classical conditioning, object permanence, sample, intelligence, and stereotypes should not be expressed in any other way because doing so will muddle the meaning of what you're trying to say. Remember that one of your goals in scientific writing is to communicate your points in the clearest way possible, so using your own words when you're not supposed to will actually reduce the quality of your writing. You can also go too far with citing. Sometimes students do this to be extra safe, and that's totally understandable. But again, the art of good writing calls for striking the right balance between citing too much and citing too little. Citing too little can be considered plagiarism, so you definitely want to avoid that. But although citing too much isn't wrong in most cases, it is not good practice. It will detract from the quality of your writing and be seen as padding your paper with meaningless fluff. The key, as always, is to consider what it is that you're communicating to the reader. 
Here's one example of oversighting. Badley and Hitch, 1974, proposed a model of working memory as an alternative to the prevailing model of short-term memory. It posits that working memory is comprised of a central executive and two slave systems, Badley and Hitch, 1974. One of the slave systems is the phonological loop, which is responsible for storage and rehearsal of verbal material, Badley and Hitch, 1974. The other slave system, which they termed the visual spatial sketch pad, is involved in rehearsing spatial information, Badley and Hitch, 1974. The job of integrating and coordinating these two slave systems falls on the central executive, Badley and Hitch, 1974. Notice the Badley and Hitch source is cited five times in this passage, but really only one is necessary. This is because it is understood that in all the other cases, you're still referring to the same source. So the four additional citations do not serve to tell the reader anything he or she doesn't already know. So these additional citations can go. And now read this again. Badley and Hitch, 1974, proposed a model of working memory as an alternative to the prevailing model of short-term memory. It posits that working memory is comprised of a central executive and two slave systems. One of the slave systems is the phonological loop, which is responsible for storage and rehearsal of verbal material. The other slave system, which they termed the visual spatial sketch pad, is involved in rehearsing spatial information. The job of integrating and coordinating these two slave systems fall on the central executive. Much better. So citing after every single sentence in a paragraph that refers to the same source is considered oversighting. Here's a different example of oversighting. Cognitive dissonance theory applies when we experience incompatible attitudes, thoughts, or behaviors, resulting in a feeling of tension and discomfort that we're motivated to reduce by justifying our attitudes, thoughts, or behaviors. Aronson and Mills, 1959, Brehm, 1956, Festinger, 1957, 1959, 1964, Festinger and Carl Smith, 1959, Tavers and Aronson, 2007. Boy, is this overkill or what? Do you really need to cite seven sources for one piece of information? The answer is you don't, especially if all of those sources say the same thing. In general, if you're citing multiple sources, each of those sources should add something substantive to your point so that if the reader were to go and read those sources you cited, he or she will gain something valuable with each source that will enhance his or her understanding. Otherwise, there is no need for extraneous citations. A general rule of thumb is no more than two or three citations, give or take, of course, depending on the situation. In this particular example, we're simply defining cognitive dissonance theory, so we're just going to retain the original source by Festinger in 1957 that proposed the theory and delete the rest. And so here's the edited version. Cognitive dissonance theory applies when we experience incompatible attitudes, thoughts, or behaviors, resulting in a feeling of tension and discomfort that we're motivated to reduce by justifying our attitudes, thoughts, or behaviors. Festinger, 1957. Much less cluttered with useless material and much better. So to add to our list here, using too many citations for one concept that do not add substantive information is another example of oversighting that you should avoid. Let's take a look at yet another example. Happiness and sadness are common emotions. Ekman and Friesen, 1971. This may not seem like an unnecessary citation at first glance, but when you think about it, do you really need support for saying something that's basically a generally undisputed fact or knowledge? You don't. So you probably don't need to cite the statement that happiness and sadness are common emotions, just like you wouldn't cite a statement like the sun rises in the east or Canada shares a border with the United States. So removing the citation is appropriate. However, if you wish to add to it something that is not common knowledge or that is an argument proposed by somebody else, then you should cite that additional material. For example, happiness and sadness are common emotions. Along with fear, anger, disgust, and surprise, these six emotions comprise a group of what has been dubbed basic emotions that some believe to be universal across different cultures. Ekman and Friesen, 1971. This latter part about basic emotions is an idea proposed by Ekman and Friesen and not considered general fact, so you would need to cite it. 
So again, adding to my list here, there is no need to cite common knowledge and generally acknowledged facts. How about one last example? My friend Kay experiences symptoms of depression in the winter months, Western and Lamb, 2007. The way that this is written suggests that you got this example about your friend Kay from Western and Lamb, which of course you didn't. It is your own personal observation, and that comes from you, so you don't need to cite it. Citing it, in fact, would be wrong because you're communicating the incorrect source to the reader. So we can remove the citation here to make it more appropriately written. Again, if you're going to add anything else that didn't come from your own original thoughts or experience, then you should cite the additional material. For example, my friend Kay experiences symptoms of depression in the winter months. She suffers from seasonal affective disorder, which tends to begin in the fall or winter and recedes in the warmer months, following closely the pattern of changes in available daylight across the seasons. Western and Lamb, 2007. So to complete our list, there is no need to cite your own personal opinion, example, observation, or data you've collected for a research project. All of these are examples of material that comes from you. Trying to figure out whether or not you're over paraphrasing or over citing isn't always easy because it does have a subjective element to it. When in doubt, get help from someone who's well versed in writing, like a tutor from your university's writing center. Some final thoughts. First, you must cite the source that you actually got the information from. Suppose you read in the textbook by Cassin, Fine, and Marcus, 2011, on page 345, the following passage. Robert Zions, 1968, found that the more often people saw a novel stimulus, whether it was a foreign word, a geometric form, or a human face, the more they came to like it. And let's say you decide to put the following in your paper. Research has found that repeated exposure to a new stimulus increases our liking for it, Zions, 1968. Now, in this case, you did paraphrase the sentence and provide a citation. However, as written, you are suggesting to the reader that you read this information from Zions 1968, when in fact, you read it in Cassin, Fine, and Marcus 2011. So the citation is inappropriate. Instead, this is what you should do. Research has found that repeated exposure to a new stimulus increases our liking for it. Zions 1968, as cited in Cassin, Fine, and Marcus 2011. In the reference section, you should include only the Cassin, Fine, and Marcus source, because that is the actual source material you used. Do not include the Zions 1968 reference. In general, you should go and read the original source, unless the original source is out of print, not available in your language, or otherwise not possible to obtain, because you don't want to fully rely on the accuracy of the secondary source. You should also beware of self-plagiarism. Now, you might be wondering, how is it even possible for someone to plagiarize themselves? Well, this could happen if you reuse a previously published work of your own and pass it off as new. In the context of university writing assignments, it is considered dishonest to submit the same assignment or even parts of a previous assignment to different courses or as separate assignments. Students sometimes think that since they wrote the paper themselves, they can use it again without attribution. But this practice actually violates academic policies, so please keep it in mind. There are exceptions where it would be acceptable to reuse your own work, but these instances are rare in the context of university writing assignments. For more information, consult the APA Publication Manual. Here are a few links to some excellent online resources on plagiarism and how to avoid it if you want to learn more or to look at additional examples.